It seems that breast cancer is on the rise. In today's show, we're going to talk more about the incidence of breast cancer, cancer susceptibility genes, and why certain people who are really healthy, who exercise, who eat a whole real foods diet, have recently been diagnosed with breast cancer, and they're perplexed about this. We're going to talk about this window of opportunity during pubescence, where individuals, when they're going through puberty, if they're exposed to certain toxins, it might actually influence later predisposition towards breast cancer. This is a, an area of research that I was able to uncover for friends and clients that I've been working with in supporting them in this fashion that they were not made aware of. And so I think it's really important to talk about BRCA1 and BRCA2. These are cancer susceptibility genes that many people have been told that they're, they have an increased risk for developing cancer because they have this tumor gene, this cancer gene, which number one, I think it's really not good from a psycho neuroimmune endocrinology standpoint to plant in your mind or the universe or the intention that you have a gene that causes cancer. What BRCA1 and BRCA2 actually do is they help repair damaged DNA. Here's actually a term from a paper that I'll share with you on the screen. BRCA1 and BRCA2 are critically important proteins. Well, first of all, these are genes that make enzymes proteins that are in the process of the repair of double-stranded DNA breaks. Let me just repeat that. BRCA1 and BRCA2 are critically important proteins in the process of repair of double-stranded DNA breaks. These are not causing cancer. They're involved in DNA repair. And so if that repair process is dysfunctional or dysregulated, that might impact the tumor microenvironment and that might uh, cause cells to become neoplastic. It doesn't mean they're causing cancer. So people with this gene should really keep in mind DNA stability and minimize the exposure of environmental toxins, pollutants, heavy metals, and x-rays and CT scans and things like that that impact the stability and the integrity of DNA. That's really important for people with this gene. What it, what it means is that their DNA repair processes may not be totally optimal. But what's important is people with this germline mutation only account for five to 10% of breast cancers and between 10 and 18% of ovarian cancers. So it's not even the majority of cancers related to breast and ovaries are caused by this germline mutation. It's a small minority. And what that means, my friends, is we have a, a huge environmental and lifestyle impact on epigenetics, on the tumor microenvironment, on the ability to maintain genomic stability and integrity. I think that's really important for people to recognize before they consider prophylactic removal of key organs like the ovaries, like the fallopian tubes, like the breasts, because we know that there are consequences linked with removing your breast tissue and getting breast implants, we're gonna talk about in a moment, and also hormonal issues linked with removing your ovaries because for women, the ovaries are the main source of estrogens and progesterone and so forth that impact mood and affect and vaginal function and overall well-being. And so I think it is important to recognize that if you do have a susceptibility gene, that you consider your environment. And, and DNA stability, it's, it's emerging from the literature as well as metabolic health, are very important when it comes to cancer etiology and the, the, the uh, prevalence of that. But here's a screenshot from Mayo Clinic. Preventative prophylactic mastectomy, surgery to reduce breast cancer risk, okay? So again, this is being promoted. I've had many clients or friends who had done some genetic testing because a first degree relative had cancer, ovary or, or breast cancer, and their doctor said, yeah, we should, we're gonna recommend prophylactic removal of these organs. Now, that would be fine if there was no consequences or side effects from removing your ovaries or your breast, but there is, and we're gonna talk about that in a moment. But I just want you to keep in mind this recommendation for women in light of the fact that it's well known that 100% of men, if they live old enough, will develop prostate cancer. They might not die from that cancer, but they will die with prostate cancer. Now, let me ask you, where's the recommendation for men that they remove their prostate? I, I looked, scored the internet, couldn't find any recommendation. So if only five to 10% of breast cancer is linked to BRCA1 and between 10 and 18% of ovarian cancer is linked to BRCA1 or BRCA2, why is there such an emphasis on removing these critically important organs for women, but no suggestion for men to re prophylactically remove their prostate? Well, because the prostate is involved in sexual function, maintaining an erection and all of that, right? It seems that for whatever reason, society is valuing the function of the prostate, but we're devaluing the critically important function of the ovaries. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We know the ovaries. I will tell you, I've worked with clients who have had a mastectomy and they've had their ovaries removed and they will tell you they've never felt the same. They've had depression issues, mood issues, vaginal dryness, uh, hormone fluctuations, weight gain. 
and all of that. So I think we really need to weigh quality of life with you know the the risk of uh, and the pros of potentially this procedure, especially considering the fact that as this image talks about here, BRCA1 and BRCA2 are not causing cancer. They are involved in repair of damaged DNA. So if you've been living a really great quality of life and are healthy and exercise and do these things and you don't have occupational exposure to chemical carcinogens, you're filtering your water and your food and so forth, what I would suggest to these people, and again, this is not medical advice, I'm not an oncologist, but I would suggest you know, doing imaging, low radiation imaging like an MRI or thermal imaging and so forth, to, to get out in front of this and just see if you are developing uh, precancerous cells or cancerous cells before prophylactically removing these, these, these tissues. Because uh, we do know that breast implants have consequences. They have side effects. So you take out your natural breasts and you get, you get augmented breasts. Well, what is that linked with? Well, here's a uh, paper in Nature Biomedical Engineering. The surface topography of silicon breast implants mediates the foreign body response in mice, rabbits, and humans. So we know that breast implants can create scar tissue. We know that they can get sort of moldy and they can create this encapsulation type of phenomenon that um, can lead to consequences of this. And there was an excellent paper here that was just published in uh, the end of 2022 titled Understanding Breast Implant Illness, Etiology is the Key. And for a lot of women, um, when they, they augment their breasts, what they do notice, well, number one, it's not really talked about, but these uh, breast implants, they don't last a lifetime. So essentially what you're signing up for is continual replacement of these every 10 to 15 years. So what, what's the harm linked with that? You have to undergo anesthesia, um, more surgery, more scars. Um, you know, that, that's, I think, not really considered in this prophylactic uh, recommendation. But also we know that fatigue and, and autoimmunity and there, there are links with breast implant illness. So again, I'm not suggesting that if you have many first degree relatives that have had breast or ovarian cancer, you don't take measures and don't consider prophylactic removal of these organs. I'm just saying you you need to consider all of the options and understand that there's no free ride here. Just removing your breasts and getting silicon breast implants is linked with downsides. And some of those downsides could be this encapsulation that I talked about, the biofilm that's created, the fatigue, the memory loss, and and potentially exacerbation of autoimmune-like symptoms. And and so these are some of the challenges here. But one of the papers that I really want to dive into and, and this is where we talk about prevention. And this might explain why some really healthy women in their 30s or their 40s or 50s are developing breast cancer and they're perplexed by this. Like, gosh, for the I just got a direct message from a dietitian who's 34 and says, I've been in the best shape of my life for the past 10 years, eating healthy, doing all these things, and I was recently diagnosed with breast cancer. Everything that you say is invalidated as a result of that because how could it be that nutrition and metabolic health and exercise impact the etiology of cancer, yet I was diagnosed with cancer and I'm so healthy? Well, it could be that this, this window of exposure during pubescence when the ovaries and the breasts are growing actually impacts later life incidence of cancer. So the title of this paper here that I thought it was just quite fascinating is Environmental Exposures During Puberty, Window of Breast Cancer Risk and Epigenetic Damage. So we're going to talk more about that. But first, friends, I just want to thank you for being here. Thanks for hitting that like button. If you're enjoying this content, please leave us a comment and also share this as a direct text message with a friend. That way they can get access to the papers that we talk about and also this information if you found it helpful. Also, we know our environment is loaded with persistent organic pollutants and endocrine disrupting chemicals. And if you're not drinking filtered water, or making sure that you're cognizant of where your food is coming from, you might want to support your body's detoxification pathways. A key pathway is glutathione. We know glutathione is one of your body's most important sulfur-bearing antioxidants. Uh, this is very critically important, especially if you drink alcohol, if you drink wine, if your occupation requires you to be exposed to things that you would rather not be exposed to, uh, glutathione can be helpful in helping to facilitate the natural elimination of that. And so one way that you can support your body's healthy glutathione levels is with N-acetylcysteine and glycine. So over at Myoscience, we put together a great combination of taurine, NAC, and glycine. So this glynat combo, glycine, 
and NAC together has been shown to help support the body's natural glutathione production process. So you can support your body's glutathione production by taking the Glynac combination before bed or even after a night of having some ethanol or eating food that was a little sketchy, for example, at a restaurant. You can save on the Glynac combination over at myoscience.com. That's M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com, myoscience with an X, and use the code podcast to save on the NAC Glycine Supreme. So going back to this paper, again, I thought this was quite fascinating. There's some wonderful images here that talk about this developmental window. And again, this might explain, for example, the etiology, the incidence of breast cancer uh, increasing in women that are really living healthy lives. And so this image here, figure A, talks about the stages of breast development. They say the breast is unique and that full maturation of the breast does not occur until later in life after puberty. During puberty, the female breast undergoes rapid changes, proliferating these terminal end buds and elongation of the ducts that promote the formation of primitive lobular structures and growth of the ductal tree. They say the high-risk field hypothesis is that specific genetic or epigenetic alterations may occur in a breast progenitor cell prior to or during puberty, and the clonal expansion of damaged progenitor cells during puberty would result in localized predisposed terminal ductal lobular units or high risk fields from which breast cancer could subsequently arise. I know that's a lot of jargon. Essentially what they're saying is that during puberty, because there's so much growth and expansion, that if there is a hit from an environmental toxin, arsenic, atrazine, benzene, PCBs, phthalates, and so forth, that that could predispose someone to later life breast cancer. And if we're talking about prevention, if we're serious about this, we should be discouraging our children from eating processed foods, from using makeup, um, and, and encouraging circadian rhythm health and filtered water uh, and so forth, and, and not using cosmetics that have endocrine disrupting chemicals in them that alter the epigenome and DNA stability. And what I think is, is quite interesting is actually in this study, they mention this stuff. They, they talk about, as you can see here in figure four, they say not using harmful cosmetics, especially during puberty. They talk about reducing pesticide exposure. Don't you love this? This is in a peer-reviewed academic journal and they're talking about these things. I mean, it's just fascinating. They're encouraging people to drink filtered water. I mean, this is fantastic. And also talking about mom-daughter-based cancer prevention strategies, that is like an anti-cancer diet, a whole, whole foods diet, not eating processed foods, avoiding, they say, harmful beauty aids that are rich in endocrine disrupting chemicals, uh, minimizing carcinogens in water by using water filters, exercising regularly. Uh, all of these things I think are so fascinating. And most importantly, mitigating DNA damage. And we know that DNA stability, we've talked about that in other videos where we talked about the importance of the Warburg effect. And also, especially for people who have BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations, DNA stability is king. And so we know that B12 and methyl and supporting uh, methyl factors and, and folate and so forth are really important for DNA stability as well as exercise. Okay. So let's take a deeper dive into what they say about the susceptibility here. I think this is important. And it's a little bit, I'm being redundant here from, from the other image here, but this is what they say, puberty and susceptibility. The mature human breast is composed of milk producing lobules connected to the nipple by a system of branching tree-like ducts surrounded by adipose tissue and connective tissue. Breast cancer is sought to develop within the terminal ductal lobular unit, the TDLU, which includes the lobule and its most proximal ducts. The breast is unique and that full maturation of the breast does not occur until later life after puberty. During puberty, the female breast undergoes rapid changes, proliferating terminal end buds and elongating to the ducts, promoting the formation of primitive lobular structures and growth of the ductal tree. These rapid structural and cellular changes are thought to create the window of susceptibility. And again, they refer back to figure uh, one that you just saw, 1A. And they say animal and, and epidemiological studies provide evidence that there are windows of susceptibility, implantation, fetal growth, puberty, pregnancy, and aging during which the breast is thought to be particularly vulnerable to environmental exposures. Environmental exposures during windows of susceptibility are hypothesized to increase subsequent breast cancer risk. There's increasing evidence that a woman's lifetime breast cancer risk is increased by exposures before and during puberty. Very important to remember that. Again, for people who have been diagnosed with breast cancer, although they're very healthy in their 40s and 50s, 
you know, there's not much we can do to go back in our teens, but again, thinking differently about preventing cancer in future generations and making sure that every home is aware that filtered water is important, whole foods are important, and that our young girls and daughters are not exposed to endocrine disrupting chemicals that might alter hormones or DNA stability. Really important. They say epidemiologic studies provide evidence that medication and disease before and during puberty increase subsequent breast cancer risk. Studies on breast cancer risk and environmental exposures before and during puberty are both difficult and important. Increasing prospective cohorts are uh, being designed to investigate events that occur during this key window of susceptibility. Needless to say, there's precocious puberty that's going on. Many children now are developing breast tissue when they're eight years old. They're drinking out of plastic bottles. They might be exposed to endocrine disrupting chemicals. They are using iPhones. I can't tell you how many women that I see, young women in particular, that hold their iPhone in their sports bra at the gym, a big no-no. We know that the safety testing on these phones actually is actually done where it's it's quite far away from the skin. It's not designed to be touching your skin, and that's why I love the safe sleeve. This is not an affiliate link or a promotion for them, but I will link them uh, in the description below because you should definitely have some sort of EMF protection in your phone um, and, and so on. But I just think this is fascinating that scientists are trying to identify that breast cancer and uh, ovarian cancer, the incidence and the prevalence is quite high and we need to do something about it. And there's actually really good evidence to suggest that, guess what? Exercise is quite effective as a preventative uh, strategy, even for women with BRCA uh, carriers. And uh, this study was just published in November of 2022. And this was a meta-analysis and they, they looked at all sorts of... Um, Again, the limitations here are self-reported analysis and so forth. But what they found is of the, the five studies that were analyzed here, four studies show that there was a reduction in the breast cancer incidence later in life in people who have adolescent exercise and young adult physical activity. I know people are like, well, my kid doesn't exercise much. They like computer games. They like Minecraft or they like to play on their phone. No, your kid needs to be, especially your young female, your daughters. I have a daughter. We're walking all the time, riding our bikes to school, staying active. Your kids need to be active, my friends. Uh, a lot of kids can get away with being sort of skinny and not gaining weight, but that doesn't mean that you're you, you still need to support their exercise endeavors. And this has an effect, especially around puberty, to prevent later life cancer. Again, um, we heard so much about uh, protecting kids from COVID and where's the similar intensity allocated towards preventing cancer in our children? I think it should be there. So um, we know that there's this window of susceptibility. And this is why in the family home, and your, your in-laws, your nieces, your nephews, like you really need to encourage healthy eating, healthy living, and moving away from the packaged processed foods, eating more whole foods, filtering the water, getting the cosmetics and cleaning products and, and things like that out of the household that could impact in a negative way, this critical window of opportunity, which may impact later life cancer development. So I wanted to share that with you because not many people uh, are aware that, uh, how important pubescence is and this window of opportunity and, and things that we can do to prevent cancer. So hopefully you found this content helpful. Let me know in the comments. Thanks as always for watching all the way through. Thanks for sharing this video. Thanks for hitting the like button and we will catch you in a future episode down the road.